Okay, so um, last time we started to talk about uh, how could we make the DFT more efficient, right? So the DFT is what's under the hood in MATLAB. It's what MATLAB and other digital signal processors use to make efficient Fourier transform calculations. And so what we talked about uh, last time was what can we do when the DFT is a power of two, right? And so we talked about basically this decimation in time algorithm is what we spent the most time on. And at the end of the lecture, we also talked about decimation in frequency. All those things basically mean is that it, at every stage of the algorithm, we're decomposing a long DFT into two DFTs that are half the length, okay? And we keep on doing that until we get down to DFTs that are only two units, you know, two time domain to two frequency domain. And those turn out to be just adds and subtracts, right? And so if you look at the time savings you get, basically you have log two of n stages and n multiplies per stage. And so that n log two gives you a much uh, more efficient algorithm than doing the DFT normally, which would be an n squared operation. And so what I want to talk about today is, so what can you do when your DFT uh, power is not two to the something, right? Or if your DFT length is not two to the something, right? You could always zero pad the DFT to be longer, right? Uh, and that's not actually a big problem for short n, right? So if I have n kind of between, say, one and a thousand, it's not so hard to just kind of wait for the next power of two, right? But if I want to do a length, you know, five million DFT, it may take me more powers of, you know, I may have to up my length substantially to get to the next power of two, right? And so what I want to talk about today is what can you do to make that process kind of a similarly fast process uh, when you don't have a power of two. Okay, so the topic of today is basically what's called the cooley tukey FFT, or D yeah, FFT. So again, these are two DSP researchers from the 60s. And let's remember our setup. So we have a DFT of length m. Okay. And here's our formula for the DFT. And let's remember that basically here n ranges from 0 to n minus 1 and wraps around, and so does k. And this wn is this special complex number e to the minus 2 pi over nj, right? The nth root of. One. Okay, so our only uh, assumption for today is going to be that n can be factored into two numbers, right? So, for example, if n is 15, I could choose those two numbers as 3 and 5, okay? And the idea is that we're going to split up this length n DFT into a whole bunch of DFTs that are of length of the smaller, you know, factors that make it up. So we're going to basically assume that n is made up of the product of two factors, okay? So what I'm going to do is I am going to be a little bit sneaky about how I represent x of n and x of k, right? Instead of treating them like they're long, skinny vectors, I am going to rearrange them into arrays, 2D arrays, okay? So this is kind of a slick idea. Um, and so what I'm going to do is say, okay, I'm going to write for example, uh, n equals n1i plus j, where i ranges from here to here, and j ranges from here to here. So let's just pause and think about what that really means, right? So let's suppose that I have, you know, uh, n equals 12, I can write that as, um, you know, I could say n1 equals 3, n2 equals 4, right? And then for any number, I could say that's like 3i plus j, where i ranges from 0, 1 to 3, and j ranges from 0, 1, 2, right? So that's like saying, basically, when j is 0, I get 0, 1, 2, 3. When j is 1, I get 4, 5, 6, 7, right? And so all I'm doing is basically I'm rearranging the numbers 0 from 11 
in terms of, you know, this is what happens when i equals 0. Or, I'm sorry, this is what happens when j equals 0. This is what happens when j equals 1. This is what happens when j equals 2. And this is what happens when i equals 0, dot, 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 i equals 3. So all I'm doing is I'm rearranging my 12 numbers in a 4 by 3 grid instead of writing them like a 12 by 1 vector. Okay. So let me pause and ask for a second. Does that make sense? So any questions about what I mean by this process? Okay. So this is the key kind of idea that we're going to use to develop a more efficient DFT. Okay. And so the idea is I am going to write the input array like that, and I'm also going to write the output array like that. And so I'm also going to say write k, the output, as you know n2a plus b, where uh, a ranges from here, and b ranges from here. So all that means is that, for example, you know, again, with my n equals 12, and my n1 equals 3, and my n2 equals 4, that means that my k is going to be written like uh, 4a plus b. And so again, I have a similar thing where this time my a is going to be like this. I'm going to have a equals 0, a equals 1, a equals 2, b equals 0, dot b equals 3. And then I'm going to basically index over here. So when b equals 0, uh, I'm sorry, when a equals 0, I get 0, 1, 2, 3. So it's kind of like taking the same numbers and rearranging them in a different uh, order, right? So I could have basically chosen to write my 4 by 3 array either the long way or the short way, right? So I write the array the long way, or I guess I write it the short way for one of them and the long way for the other one, OK? And so I'm going to put this together, right? So what I'm going to say is, let's take a look at my old DFT formula, right? And now I'm going to substitute in what I have told you about n and k, right? So that's like saying, okay, this sum here is now going to become a double sum. Instead of summing from 0 to 11, I'm going to sum from 0 to 3 and 0 to 4, right? So basically here, this is going to be a sum over i and j. So let's write this in that way. So first thing I do is I'm going to write that double sum here. So i is going to range from 0 to n2 minus 1. And j is going to range from 0 to n1 minus 1. Then my input is now going to be indexed by this double array. And my wn is going to be to the k n power, but now n involves both i and j, right? And if I do the same thing for k, that means that now I'm going to plug in what I know about k. I know k is n to a plus b. Now I have double sum. Oops, yeah. This part stays the same. Now I have to deal with this double thing up here. So you may be asking yourself, why am I getting something better here? We're going to talk about that in just a second. Right? So now basically all I've done is I've rewritten the DFT formula just in terms of thinking about the input as a 2D array and thinking about the output as a 2D array. Okay. And now I'm going to start to make some simplifications here. So one thing that I can kind of immediately notice is that some of these exponential terms are going to make my life easier. So let's just focus on this part for just a second. So let me rewrite that. So here I have this wn to the n to a b plus b, n1 i plus j. I'm just going to write out all my terms there. I'm going to have a n1, n2, a i. I'm going to have a n1 i b. I'm going to have a n2 a j. And I'm going to have a b j. OK. So the first thing to remember is that you know this product, right? We said at the very beginning that I was factoring n, right? 
n equals n1, n2, right? So whenever I see an n1, n2, I know this is just the same as capital N, and that means that this part here is just a 1, right? Wn to the n power is 1. And so that means that this whole term here is just 1, right? So I can forget that. The next thing to notice is that let's remember what is, you know, Wn, right? Wn is defined as e to the minus 2 pi over n j. Not the same, I'm, I guess this was a bad choice. So this is not the same j as this. This is the imaginary number j. So what do I have if I take, for example, you know, uh, Wn to the n1 power, right? Well, that's like, you know, n is like w like this, right? So this is a product. And so if I have e to the 2 pi over n1, n2j, and I take that to the n power, then these guys are going to cancel out. What I'm going to get is minus 2 pi over little n2j, which is the same thing as w sub n2, right? So that's like saying that if I see the capital N of w raised to one of the factors, what I get is the w for some other smaller number. So that means I can rewrite this whole thing as equaling this part here is the same as saying I have uh, w sub n2 to the ib. This guy here is the same as saying I have w little n1 aj, and that guy here doesn't change. So let me just stop and ask any questions about what I did here. OK. So now I can make a simplification, right? So now I'm going to plug in what I know back into my original formula. Going back to my previous formula, what I have is I have x of n2a plus b equals this sum. This sum. I have my x sorted as this 2D array. And now what I have is the w parts. I have this little w n1 to the aj. I have w n to the bj, w little n2 to the ib. OK. And now this is the point where you can see something magical happening, right? So this guy here on the inside looks like a short DFT, right? It's like saying, okay, for the purposes of the sum, i is a constant, right? And all I'm doing is I'm changing j to go from 0 to n1 minus 1. I'm multiplying it by this appropriate, you know, this appropriate Fourier series complex number. And so this basically inside here is an n1 length DFT. OK? So once I've computed that guy, right, then there's also a, you know, there's a number here I have to kind of worry about. Uh, this is like kind of like a twiddle factor. Actually, if I'm being really clear here, let me just make <coughs> one slight change here. This is all true, but let me say I forgot to say that the twiddle factor needs to be inside this sum. So, Let's write this a different way. Let's say this. Let me do the j sum first. I realize now that I should have been a little bit more careful. OK. I'm going to write it like this. Let's <coughs> OK, so this is better. This is like saying here, this is saying for fixed j, right? So for j is being a fixed number, this is a length n2 DFT. Then this, again, if j is constant inside the sum, this is like a twiddle factor. And then this outer sum, is like a n1 length DFT. OK? And this is where the, the savings comes in, right? 
So the idea is that what I'm doing on the inside is here, for every fixed j, I'm doing a smaller dft, right? So for example, here I'm doing little n1 length little n2 dfts, right? And then on the outside, since this guy is ranging over uh, this, on the outside, this guy is like saying I have to do little n2 length little n1 dfts. So if I put it all together, kind of what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, I need to do uh, n1 length n2 dfts. We need n2 length n1 dfts. And then I need capital N multiplications by twiddle factors. Okay. And so that is going to save me some time. We're going to compute the time savings in just a second. Actually, I guess I can do it now. Suppose that I do, um, you know, assuming kind of uh, naive, you know, smaller length DFTs. We can count up what I need. Basically, typically, if I do the DFT in the in the naivest way possible, it requires n squared operations. So that's like saying I need this many n squared operations and this many n one squared operations plus the extra capital N I need. And so if I kind of factor out the capital N, what I have here is I have an n one plus an n two plus one, right? And this is actually just an upper bound since a lot of these multiplications can be made uh, you know, much smaller, right? So here, this is like saying that instead of, you know, instead of n squared, I have n times the sum of the factors, okay? And that turns out to be a lot smaller, right? So in general, if, you know, n is the product of, you know, a whole bunch of factors, then what I have here is the number of multiplications is equal to n times the sum of the factors. And this is kind of a general form of what we talked about last time, right? So if we think about it, what we talked about last time was that if n was 2 to some power, right, then we showed, you know, the radix 2 FFT uh, had, you know, approximately n log 2 of n multiplications, right? And here, this is the same idea, right? So in this case, log 2 of n equals v, right? And so if I was to say, okay, well, add up the number of factors here, this would be like saying I'm going to add, you know, 2 plus 2 plus 2, you know, v times, right? So this is going to be 2v. And so I have the same result where, you know, you know the Cooley-Tukey FFT is like a generalization with the same kind of efficiency, but n can be anything. So I realize this is all still a little bit abstract. Let me make this a little bit more concrete for you guys because this is what I want you to try and implement on the homework, okay? And so in terms of what you actually have to do to make this happen, it's actually very straightforward, right? So here is the more sketchy picture of how it works, okay? So let's suppose that I'm gonna have n equals 15, okay? And I'm gonna choose to factor that, there's only one way to do it, as five times three. 
Okay? So I start out with my initial vector x, right? And like good computer science people, I'm going to start numbering this at 0, okay? And so this is my original x vector. The first thing I do is I sort it into a 3 by 5 array. Okay. And so here, what I'm doing is this is kind of going to be going from my n world to my ij world. Okay. And how do I put the elements into the array? Well, what I do is I put them in just in left to right order. And when you come to do this in MATLAB, you know, you're going to find out that there are some commands that are very helpful for this kind of thing. So check out, for example, you know, the MATLAB reshape command. It doesn't do exactly this, but you can figure out how to make it do this. Okay. And so now what I'm going to do, right, is I'm going to say this is like i equals 0, this is like i equals 1, this is like i equals 2. This is like j equals 0 all the way up to j equals 4. Okay? And so my first step is I'm going to do a whole bunch of length 3 DFTs. So I'm going to do a DFT down this column, a DFT down this column, and so on. So basically step 1 is do 5 length 3 DFTs. Okay? Step two is to multiply the three by five array by a three by five array given by this twiddle factors. Right? So here the B is going from zero to two, the J is going from zero to four. Okay? So that's like saying I take another Twiddle factor matrix that is 3 by 5. And I element by element multiply my result from here times this. <coughs> then step 3 is now I've got some new array and I'm going to do DFTs along the rows. So I'm going to do 3 length 5 DFTs. And the last thing is I'm going to um, put the 2D elements back into a 1D vector, right? Because this here is my kind of, you know, A, B world. What I want is to go back into K world. How do I do that? I take them out in a different order than I put them in. So instead of, I take them out like this. <coughs> and that gives me my XKs. Right, so this, this is the most important picture of the day, right? This tells you how to solve this problem for this toy example, but it operates for any example, right? So let me just recap. So I take the original signal, I make a 2D array, I put the elements into the 2D array in row order. Okay. I take a bunch of DFTs down the columns, I multiply by some special matrix, then I take the DFTs across the rows, and then I remove the elements from the matrix to get back my long vector. Okay. And also, another handy MATLAB command for a matrix, if I have a, a matrix and I do M of column, so that's another thing that will say, okay, take the elements out of this matrix, you know, and put them back into a long skinny vector, right? So reshape and this colon operator are really <coughs> the main things that you need to do this. Okay. All right, so let me pause and ask, is that process clear? So this is a pretty slick idea, right? I, I really like the kind of mechanics of it. You take the original signal, you make a kind of matrix out of it, you do DFTs here, you do DFTs here, and then you take the, vector, take the elements out, right? And it turns out that that process is very efficient, right? So 
Um, again, the idea would be that I don't have to stop here, right? In theory, you know, supposing that I had, um, you know, a, say, n equals 75 DFT, right? So what I could do is say, okay, I want to do a 75 point DFT. I could first start by decomposing that into, you know, 25, uh, 3 DFTs, and then 3, 25 DFTs, right? But every time I have to do that 25 DFT, I could further decompose that into 5 length 5 DFTs and 5 length 5 DFTs over here. And so what happens is eventually you break the DFT down into just its prime factors, right? Question? Sorry, in the previous page, um, the multiplication is element, sorry. This element, yes, this is an element by element multiplication, right? And so, again, to do element by element multiplication in MATLAB, you need to use the dot times, not the regular times. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and so, computationally, this is uh, you know, kind of neat because there have been people who spent a lot of time back in the 60s, so you don't have to, figuring out how to make super efficient short length DFTs, right? So there somewhere is the most efficient length 3 DFT that you could imagine, right? And those are all hardwired into MATLAB and into DSP chips and stuff like that. And so the idea is that, you know, when you get down to these really short DFTs, you're getting the most efficient implementation of that DFT possible, and in the meantime, any longer DFT is being broken down into those factors, right? So it's a pretty neat idea, okay? So what I want you to do on the homework, right, is to implement the normal DFT, just follow your nose as if you're doing a normal matrix multiplication, that n squared thing. And then I want you to <coughs> do this DFT, the one where you, instead you take the long vector, you have to figure out two, you know, factors that um, will work. And so again, let's just switch over to MATLAB for just a second. So again, there's some MATLAB commands, right? If you look at like help factor, for example, you know, I guess I should just say something like this, you know, factor 75, right? It will give you some factors, right? So you don't have to, well, this is the way that you would do it, right? So you could say, for example, I'm just going to recursively factor my number and I'm going to just take the first two elements, multiply them together, that's going to be my little n1, and my second element is going to be little n2. For your guys' purposes, you don't need to think about like what is the right way to apportion the factors in each step. You know, you just keep on basically factoring until you get down to you know uh, prime number, in which case it gives you only one thing. So you've got a statement, an if statement in there somewhere that says, you know, if the length of factor of n is equal to one, then you just call your original DFT function that you wrote, assuming you can't do any better than that. Otherwise, keep on doing it. Right? So this is going to be a recursive algorithm that keeps on trying to factor things until you're down. <coughs> <coughs> okay. So, question. Yes. Right. So the question is, you could imagine. And that's an interesting question. So you could take the array, and if you could factor it into, say, you know, say it had an element, say it had a, you know, uh, what would be a good example, a thirty-dimensional. DFT, right? That's two times three times five. And you could imagine an algorithm that would instead take that thing, turn it into a rectangular cube of numbers, right? That's two by three by five units. I do the DFT in direction one, the DFT in direction two, the DFT in direction three. Yes, yeah, so that, that in theory would work, right? Um, but we didn't kind of talk about how the indexing works there, right? So yes, I believe there are generalizations of that, but I think that in practice, most of the algorithms that you see will bring it down to 2D rather than try and doing it in a higher dimension, just because I don't think you gain that much computationally. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. So other, other questions or comments about this? <coughs> so the, the last part of the homework asks you to compare what you get to uh, MATLAB's built-in FFT, right? And so you're going to find that your algorithms, any algorithm you write is going to totally suck compared to MATLAB, because MATLAB, that's what they do for a living, right? So uh, you probably will not be able to, like, I mean, MATLAB's FFT will be so much faster than even your Kulituki FFT, but I think, I, I just want you to see what you see. I mean, I think that part of the goal is for you to, for a range of n, right? So now you're going to be able to say, okay, when you run your algorithm on the range of n from, like, say, 0 to 1,024, you should see, you know, kind of 
spikes and dips in performance, right? So for powers of two, hopefully your Kulituki FFT will have much better performance than a prime number that is close to that power of two, right? You should be able to see in your algorithm some fluctuation, especially as you get to larger numbers. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of what the goal of this homework is, is to, for you to kind of get your hands dirty and play around with it. No nope. question? Okay. Okay, so, so that for, the, for the bulk of the class, that is all you need to know, okay? But for the few people who are taking this at the graduate level and also for those that are interested, now what I want to talk about is one kind of a neat uh, <coughs> extension of this, right? Uh, that, you know, if, if you're a real purist, right, the annoying part about this is that you still have these twiddle factors, right? Now, the twiddle factors are not adding a uh, crazy amount of computation to things, but still, I mean, wouldn't it be nice if you could just say, okay, I'm going to take the input, put it into this matrix form, DFT is this way, DFT is that way, and take the result out, right? No twiddling, just like straight out DFTing along every dimension, right? That it would be very satisfying to be able to do that, right? And so there is a way to do that, um, and that's what I'm going to talk about next. So again, just making sure you guys know, so the bulk of you, this is just kind of like extra lecture, right? So don't worry about this. If, if the math is, let the math wash over you, you know, like a gentle wave. Um, so, okay. That advanced DFT is called the Good Thomas FFT. Okay, so uh, how to uh, get rid of the twiddle factors. Uh, that is called the Good Thomas FFT. And so this re relies on some results from um, kind of abstract math, right? And so just um, to kind of give you some context, right? So there are, there's courses in math called like number theory, right? And there are also the courses like abstract algebra, right? Those courses are the kinds of things that you would take if you were a pure math major. And I was a pure math major, so that's why I like this stuff. Um, and so we could use some results from those uh, courses to make our more efficient FFT, okay? And so the first thing, so we, so now we're, now we're all math stuff, right? So we're gonna talk about some theorems. I'm not gonna prove the theorems, I'm just gonna tell you the results, okay? Um, and so, one result is the following. So if A and B are integers, not both zero, then we have something that's called the greatest common divisor. And you may remember this very vaguely from like when you were maybe in what, like sixth grade or something? <coughs> The greatest common divisor. You never thought that you'd need to see it again. And sometimes what we use the notation for is parentheses A, B, if we're being mathematical, right? Or sometimes you see it called GCD of A, B. So first of all, such a thing exists. It may be obvious that it exists, but we're not going to prove it. So the proof of the, the theorem is that the greatest common denominator or the greatest common divisor exists and there are integers uh, let's call them M0 and N0 so that the greatest common divisor is can be written like this and kind of what we're going to care about here is that if a and B have greatest common divisor one. Uh, A and B are called relatively prime. And there exist M0 and N0 so that, you know, in this case, on the left-hand side, I have one. Okay, so what this means, for example, is, you know, so let's take three and four, for example, right? So, you know, three is prime, four is not prime itself, it's two squared, but three and four are relatively prime because they don't have any common factors, right? And so 
3 and 4, the GCD is 1. And the other part of the theorem is telling me that I should be able to find some other integers, and, and these, I should say, integers, such that this equation is true. And I can fool around with this as I can say, OK, so what I want to get is you know, something times 3 plus something times 4 equals 1. And just kind of eyeballing it, I can say, OK, if I take 4 times 4 is 16, you know, minus 5 times 3 is minus 15. And so I found such a thing, right? Now, that doesn't really tell you how to do that uh, in a systematic way. Uh, I just kind of eyeballed it, right? But if you look in MATLAB, again, MATLAB is the answer to everything. So there is a, uh, I believe there's a GCD function. So if I do GCD of, you know, 5 and 6, for example, it tells me that these guys don't have any uh, factors in common. And if I help GCD, I should be able to see that if I ask for it, right, the second bullet says, G, if I provide, you know, two more entries, it also returns exactly, you know, some extra things that help me solve the equation I just mentioned, right? So, for example, if I look at 3 and 4, right, so if I say, you know, GCD is GCD of 3 and 4, right, um, oh, well, this, this tells me I'm an idiot, right? Because it tells me that, yes, the GCD is 1, and if I had really thought carefully about it, <laughs> I would have noticed that 4 minus 3 equals 1, right? So that would probably be the easier way to do it. So this tells you that, you know, the, G the, the factors are not, uh, you know, the, the, the multiple things that you have are not unique, OK? But point being that you don't have to guess it or eyeball it, right? MATLAB will give it to you, OK? OK, so just as a comment, 4 minus 3 also equals 1. So there's an infinite set of these m0 and n0 that would make this work. Okay. All right. So what we need to make these efficient um, uh, FFTs are, for some historical reason I don't know, called the Chinese remainder theorems, presumably because they were discovered in China or by some Chinese person. Okay. So. Again, this is like a kind of a very number theory, abstract algebra kind of thing. Okay, so here are the theorems. Okay, so so big picture, what is the, where am I going with this? Okay, so what I want to do is I'm going to take a big number, I'm going to break it down into its relatively prime factors, and then I'm going to kind of look to see what I want is kind of like a way to index from the big number to things having to do with each of the factors. Okay, so here's the first. There are basically two theorems. The first one is um, given a set of integers, so let's say that this has, you know, that are pairwise relatively prime. And a set of integers c0, c1, through ck with this property. Then the system I'm just going to write this down instead of narrating it. Then I'm going to say it again. So what I'm saying is, I take a big number, I break it down into some relatively prime factors, and then I look at the, you know, for each of the relatively prime factors, I kind of look at a remainder, right? Let me make this a little more concrete. So let's suppose that I have, you know, let's suppose I have, you know, m1 equals 3. I guess I should say I start at 0. I have m0 equals 3, m1 equals 4, m2 equals 5, right? 
So the product of these things, you know, 3 times 4 times 5 is equal to 60. So what the first Chinese remainder theorem is saying is that, you know, suppose I have, you know, a question of finding x so that x is equal to 1 mod 3 and equals 2 mod 4 and equals 0 mod 5. Right? So here, so let's remember what mod means, right? So this is again like something that you learned like way, way back when, right? So mod basically means that I look at the remainder when I take out an integer number of multiples, right? So for example, you know, 9 mod 4 is equal to 1, right? Because I take out, you know, the, the multiples of 4 and I get 1. Or, you know, 3, you know, 3 mod 5 is equal to 3, you know, 15 mod 2 is equal to 1, you know, stuff like that, right? So all I'm doing is I'm kind of saying, okay, I'm, I'm trying to find some number in the range from 0 to 59 that satisfies these three mod equations, right? And so what the first Chinese remainder theorem is telling me is that, first of all, every time I do this, there is a solution, right? And second of all, that that solution in that range is unique, okay? So in some sense, the way I think about this is that I have three choices for the mod here, I have four choices for the mod here, and I have five choices for the mod here. So in theory, there are 60 possible equations like this I could make, right? And so what the Chinese remainder theorem is telling me is that for every one of these 60 choices, that some solution exists between 0 and 59, and that there are no doubles, right? So like each and every one of those possibilities exists. Now, it doesn't prescribe for me how to get back the answer, but it tells me that the, that the answer exists. Question? Uh, I don't understand where the 1, 2, and 0. So basically, for example, this is like saying, okay, so I guess I haven't told you how to solve this yet, but we could try and figure it out, right? So for example, this is like saying, okay, let's try this again. So, you know, I want to find an x that is, you know, 1 mod 3, it's 2 mod 4, and it's 0 mod 5, I'm telling you that information, right? That's the find an x such that this is true, OK? So it's kind of like a puzzle, OK? So I pose this to you, find that x, right? And so here, for example, I could always do it exhaustively. Right? I could say, like, this last clue is telling me that x has to be multiple of 5, <coughs> right? x has to be multiple of 5, so I have to look at, you know, 0, 5, 10, so I guess I can just kind of write them out, right? All the way up to 55. And now I say, okay, now it has to be 1 mod 3. So that means it has to be multiple of 3 plus 1, right? So this guy is out, and this guy is out. This is 9 plus 1. Are you saying 1, 2, and 0 are arbitrary just for this example? Yes. One, yeah, it's just an example. But we can figure out what the answer is, actually, right? So this is out, this is out. This is 24 plus 1. This is out, this is out. This is 39 plus 1. This is out. This is out. This is 54 plus 1. And now of these guys, which one of these guys are 2 mod 4? Well, it's this guy, right? This is 8 plus 2. Whereas this is out. This is 23 plus 2. This is 38 plus 2. This is 53 plus 2. So, right? so now I find out that my x is equal to 10, right? So the Chinese remainder theorem told me that I had to find an answer at all and that I wasn't going to find multiple answers, OK? So, Basically, this is kind of going one way, right? This is telling me that if I have a, you know, triple like this, I can, you know, I can figure out my 10, right? So what I want to try to do is I want to make a conversion map between the big numbers and the remainders when I divide through by the prime factors, right? So, so far this is just an existence proof telling me that you know, that that works. Yeah? So maybe Oh, yeah, okay. So, so maybe, yeah, maybe I should have written it this way. So this is probably the right way to say it. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I was being a little bit sloppy here. <coughs> right, this is what I mean, right? Okay, so this is like, okay, this, this is a nice theorem, but 
it doesn't tell me kind of how to find which is the right answer, right? I mean, obviously, this is all well and good, but I found my answer here just kind of like by fumbling my way through it, right? So here is the second Chinese remainder theorem that kind of tells me how to get these things, or how to get this if I know these. If I know this, I can easily get these just by taking the mods, right? Taking the mods, the forward way is easy. The backward way is hard. Okay, so the second Chinese remainder theorem is the following. Let, you know, M equal this product. The, uh, again, I'm just going to write this down first, and then I'll read it to you. So basically, this is like saying, here is the, you know, the length of the DFT I care about, the big length. And then I'm factoring it into these relatively prime factors. Okay. Now I'm going to let, I'm basically going to divide through each of these guys. So this is like taking, taking the big guy and dividing it through by the smaller guys. Okay. So for example, you know, let me make a table. Let's suppose that m equals 60. I could have, you know, my little mi's are going to be, say, 3, 4, and 5. That means that my big mi's are going to be, you know, 60 divided by 3 is 20, 60 divided by 4 is 15, 60 divided by 5 is 12, right? So basically, these capital mi's are like the product of the remaining factors, okay? Okay, and then I'm going to let ni satisfy this equation. There's like a zillion little, you know, variables in this lecture, I'm sorry. Okay, so what am I doing here? Well, here what I'm saying is that these two numbers, by the way I constructed them, are relatively prime, right? Since these factors, right, they don't have any divisors in common, right? Just because I set it up that way, okay? And that means that since these guys are relatively prime, I can use my theorem from a few slides ago, basically saying that in that case, I should be able to find two integers so that the integer times one plus the integer times the other gives me one, right? That's exactly what I'm saying here. These are the two <coughs> relatively prime pieces. Okay, so these things exist. Then, The, equation, the set of equations that I talked about earlier is uniquely solved by, and I'm going to put this on a different page because it's so exciting, this. What? Okay. So first of all, let's think about what this means, right? So let's actually solve something with the 60 example. So let's say that I have, you know, m equals 60. I'm going to choose my uh, I'm going to choose my mi as being 3, 4, and 5. My capital mi are going to be 20, 15, and 12. <coughs> And now I have to find, for each of these guys, what are the capital Ni and little ni that satisfy this equation. And I can be a little bit lazy about it. So for example, I can use MATLAB to say, OK, if I have, for example, 3 and 20, this is telling me that 7 times 3 and minus 1 times 20 works, right? Which, which makes sense. So, right, so this is like saying that I have, uh, I have to make sure I do this in the right order. So 7 times 3 minus 1 times 20, right? This is 21. This is minus 20. OK, so that's 1. I guess I could actually kind of eyeball this, right? So here, in the case of 15 and 4, I can see that 4 times 4 
minus 1 times 15 gives me 1. And in the case of 5 here, I can see that, let me think about this. Um, well, let's go back to MATLAB because I'm lazy. So the GCD of 5 and 12, 5 and minus 2. Yeah, that makes sense because that's like saying that 5 times 5 is 25, minus 2 times 12 is 24. Okay. All right. And so I can also make this table that says here I'm going to need the product of mi and i. So here I have these two guys multiplied together is minus 20. These two guys multiplied together is minus 15. These two guys multiplied together is minus 24. Okay. So now putting this together, what does this mean? This tells me that these are magic numbers that I can use to figure out how to go from the remainders back to the big number. So how does this work? So for example, let's suppose I tell you that, um, you know, example is I tell you that, um, you know, my magic number C is equal to, uh, you know, let's say C mod 3 is equal to 2. C mod 4 is equal to 1. C mod 5 is equal to 2. Okay. Well, instead of having to enumerate all the possibilities like I did on my last time, this theorem tells me how to get there. Right? So it says, okay, so what I need to do is I need to take, you know, the remainder here, I take the 2, that's the CI for 3, I multiply it by minus 20. Then I take the 1, I multiply by that the minus 15. And I take the 2, and I multiply by that the minus 24. I add these numbers up. What do I get is minus 40, minus 15, minus 48 is equal to minus 103. I take that mod 60. So I can see that if I add 120 to this, I get 7, right? No, I get 17, right. So. This tells me that I, my answer should be 17. And if I look at it, I can verify, yeah, 17 mod 3 is 2, right? 17 minus 15. 17 mod 4 is 1, 17 minus 16, and 17 mod 5 is equal to 2, right? So this, this theorem now tells me, for any triplet of remainders, how do I go back to the number between 0 and 60, or 0 and 59, that gives me the right answer, right? So now I have kind of a prescriptive way of going from one to the other, OK? All right, so let me just stop and ask, do people kind of understand? You don't have to understand, but you know, people understand kind of where, where I'm going with this. What I've proven right now is that I have a way from going from a big number to some smaller remainders and vice versa. And now you're thinking, okay, well, how does that help me at all with Fourier transforms, right? It seems like we, we stopped talking about Fourier transforms a long time ago, right? So let's kind of pull it back to the Fourier transforms and think about, okay, how are we going to use this for the Fourier transform? Okay. The main thing that we proved all the way up to this point is that there's kind of this one-to-one -one correspondence between the residuals and the big number. Okay. So what's the point of all this? And how do we get back to the FFT? Okay. So back to the FFT. So I have, here's my generic formula. Okay, so here's where the magic happens, all right? And life is going to get a little bit hairy here. But again, the main idea, so you know where I'm going, is that all I'm going to do is the same kind of idea. I'm going to turn the long skinny vector into an array. I'm going to take the FFTs down the columns, the FFT across the rows, and I'm going to bring the into back into a long skinny vector. The main difference is that I am putting the elements into the vector in a different order, right? This magical order that comes from the theorem I just proved. Okay, so it's kind of like if I just am careful about how I put the elements into the vector, <laughs> I can undo it later on. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. Before, I had this formula for n that told me that the elements should go into the matrix in this way, right? So let me just come back here. All right, so one of the first things I wrote was this. Write n equals, you know, one factor times i plus j. That let me put things into the matrix in this very nice kind of column-wise order, right? Here I'm going to write n in some wacko way. 
Again, something that only depends on two elements, but I'm going to say write n equals i n2 n2 plus j n1 n1, like this. So I'm going to say let n be oops, the product of these two relatively prime factors. That's the setup. And here what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, so here, um, again, I have to kind of, in case I overflow, I need to do this mod n, whatever this is. And the idea is that here, i is n mod n1, and j is n mod n2. So this is like saying that, how do I put the elements into my array? What I do is I take the, I guess I should, yeah, I take the number that I have, and I take the mod by both of the little factors, right? And so here's where the Chinese remainder theorem is coming in. It's like saying that inside the FFT, I have to index from the zero entry all the way up to the capital N minus one entry, right? So I have capital N numbers inside here. What I'm doing is I'm converting those capital N numbers to this 2D array, ij. So here, i, by the way that the mod works, has to range between here and here, and j has to range between here and here, right? And the Chinese remainder theorem is telling me that when I do these mods, I'm never going to get a double you know, ij. Like for every little n, there's a unique ij that I'm going to get. And so this ij is going to become my new thing over the sum. And this, by the Chinese remainder theorem, is how I get back from little ij back to capital N, right? So this is kind of like the conversion formula between going back and forth between the skinny vector and the array, OK? And so I'm going to write a whole mess of stuff in just a second. In the same way, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this number, which again is ranging over 0 to n minus 1, and I'm going to say uh, that, let me just say k1 is equal to so this is a slightly different way of writing the 2D index and going back to the So here, this is like saying, this is like the way I do the input. This is the way I do the output. This is converting between the long skinny vector of the output to the two remainders for the smaller array. Again, I'm going to make this more concrete in just a second. But what I'm going to do is, you know, all this is possible by the Chinese remainder theorem. So now I'm going to substitute all this crap into here, OK? And let's see what happens. So what I get is that I have a new index for my k. Then I have, you know, this sum here. And I have this sum here. And then I have my new n, which has got a more confusing way of converting between the two indices and the one indices. Then I have my Wn to some really complicated power because I'm substituting nk here. So again, here I have to think about this nutso exponent has to simplify somehow, right? So what I have here is I have i k1 n2 squared n2 wn to the j k2 n1 squared n1. I, I do have some simplification, though, because then I have, like, if I multiply this term times this term, 
this little n1 times little n2 is this capital N. We showed before that that just drops away. So this product drops away, and this product drops away. What I have left is this. And how can I make this simpler? Well, let's just take a look at this for a second. This is like saying if I have wn to the n1 squared capital N1, that's like saying I have wn to the n1 to the n1 n1. And this is just the same as my little n2. And by the way I set this up, this is equal to wn2 because of, this is a little bit confusing, but basically because n1, n1 plus n2, n2 equals 1. If I mod this whole thing by n2, this part drops away, and I can see that this mod n2 is the same as 1, right? So all I'm trying to get at is that this whole nasty crap turns into w n2 to the j k2 power. And this all crap turns into w n1 to the i k1 power. And that means I can rewrite this whole thing as, and here I'm going to kind of be a little bit more uh, matrixy. I'm going to say, OK, it's kind of like saying that the k1, k2 entry here is like this guy. I have like the ij entry of x. Then I have these guys here. And then I have these guys here. And again, what have I done? In the inside, I have length n1 DFTs. And on the outside, I have length n2 DFTs. And so this is clean in the sense there are no kind of twiddle factors to deal with. So, I mean, you could argue that that was a lot of math to go through just to get rid of the twiddle factors. But, you know, it's my class. I can tell you things. So, uh, so let's again make this a little more concrete, right? So to make this more concrete, what this is telling me is that I can do DFTs down the columns across the rows as long as I sort the input and the output in this weird order, right? So let's, let's go back to our length 15 example. So again, with uh, capital N equals 15, little n1 equals 3, little n2 equals 5. And again, I'm going to need to have uh, some numbers that, since these guys are relatively prime, I can say, OK, 2 times 5 is 10. <coughs> minus 3 times 3 is 9 gives me the 1 that I want. So these numbers are going to be important later. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, I have my 0 to 14 input. Now the input map gets sorted in a slightly weirder way. But this one is still kind of easy to see what it should be. So I have i ranging from 0 to 2 j ranging from 0 to 4. And the order in which I put these things in looks like the following. So it's some weirdo order. And at first it looks kind of random. But actually, if you look at it carefully, there's kind of a pattern to it, right? And the pattern is that all I'm doing is I'm putting the entries in kind of along the diagonals, right? So kind of it's like saying I start at the upper left-hand corner, and I put the 1 here, put the 2 here. Now when I go down here, there's no you know, place to put the 3. But since everything is periodic, the 3 kind of wraps around to this position. Then I have the 4. The next place is 5. The 5 wraps around over here. The 6 wraps around up here, 6, 7, 8, 9. So basically, it's kind of you know, still a systematic way of putting in the input into this matrix. So now what I would do is I would take the you know, DFTs, you know, down the columns. Then I would take the DFTs 
across the rows with no twiddling involved. And then I have to unpack my 3 by 5 matrix back into my original length vector. And so my output map, again, not the same as the input map and also looks a little bit weirder. <coughs> so the output map looks like this. And that's how I resort back into my 0 to 14 elements of capital XK. And again, even here, this still has some kind of systematic form to it. Like, for example, you can tell that you know, these guys are all separated by 3, and these guys are all separated by 5, right? So it wouldn't be that hard to fill in this matrix by just saying, OK, I'm going to take the you know, multiples of 3 in this direction, the multiples of 5 in this direction, and I'm going to add up 3 in every row to get that, right? So it's not like it's a, you know, it's, it, it's not totally random there either. And so this is the nice result, is that um, all I have to do is put the elements into the matrix one way, DFT, DFT, take them out in another way, and I have the answer for this long skinny vector, right? And so this tells me that I can do, uh, you know, DFTs in a bunch of different ways, right? So for example, let's suppose that I had to deal with a, you know, length, you know, 1,000 DFT, right? Well, I could do a couple things, right? So I could say, okay, I'm going to start with my length 1,000 DFT, and I could split it up into, using the Good-Thomas algorithm, a whole bunch of 125 DFTs and then a whole bunch of 8 DFTs, right? Because 125 and 8 are relatively prime. They have no factors in common, right? Now, at this point, you know, 125 is 5 cubed. And so I can't apply the good Thomas DFT anymore because like 5 and 25 have the 5 in common, right? So I can't do any of my number theory tricks. And so all I could do would basically is say, okay, I'm going to use the Cooley Tukey FFT to get me a bunch of length 5 DFTs and a bunch of length 25 DFTs. And then I'm going to further decompose these guys into a bunch of length 5 and 5. And here in the same way, I would decompose these into a bunch of 2 and 4 and a bunch of 2 and 2. Or I could have started with a whole different structure and said, OK, I'm going to use Cooley Tukey to do a whole bunch of length 100 DFTs and a whole bunch of length 10 DFTs. And then I'm going to use the good Thomas to get me 5 and 2. And here I could do, you know, Cooley Tukey to do 10 and 10. And then I could use good Thomas to do 5 and 2 and 5 and 2, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I'm still fundamentally doing a whole bunch of length 5 DFTs and a whole bunch of length 2 DFTs. And in some sense, you know, why would you choose one structure over the other is something I don't want to really talk about that much. But fundamentally, you could imagine that, you know, uh, the number of multiplies I might have to do could be slightly different. And more importantly, the way that things like numerical round-off errors propagate through this tree structure could be different. And so one thing that I find kind of is one of these things like boring but important is structures for implementing filters, right? So if you page through the book, you will see that for a given choice of how to do something, usually there are a whole bunch of equivalent filter forms, right? And each of those has slightly different implications and properties for how bad the error could be if you have a long filter, if you have a, you know, a, a short, um, you know, floating point length or something like that, right? Anyway, so that's kind of all I wanted to say about DF or FFT type stuff. I mean, just to say that there have been a lot of people who have thought about, number one, how to do all the stuff at the bottom of the tree super efficiently, and number two, the right way to arrange the operations in order to save yourself as many computations as possible. I mean, you might argue that these days, maybe, I mean, I think, I think the FFT is still critically important. Uh, back in the day, when it seemed like you couldn't use, you know, Fourier analysis because it was just too burdensome to compute Fourier transforms, the FFT really rejuvenated a lot of computational signal processing when it was revealed that, hey, you know, you can actually do this stuff efficiently. And so this kind of led to a real resurgence of DSP kind of research and innovation kind of, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, when people realized that you weren't limited to the naive form, right? So this is kind of a way, you know, especially for those of you that are more kind of 
computer science minded, you can kind of start to see how algorithms and data structures and stuff like that would come into signal processing, right? In terms of trying to squeeze all you could out of these kinds of algorithms. So, okay. So, any questions about any of this? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if it's something you want to talk about on the previous slide. Yep. Uh, Yes, so the capital N1 and N2 are related to the structure by, um, so if I were to be a little more explicit, one thing I said on my previous slide was that the formula for getting back to, you know, if I, if I tell you I and J, how do I get back to capital N, right? So for example, um, let me just be a little more explicit here. So in this case, I'm like saying it's like I have 10i minus, I, I guess, uh, 9j mod 15, or 10i plus 6j mod 15. And over here, I have k is k1 and 2 plus k1 and And so that's like saying I have k1, you know, 5k1 plus 3k2 mod 15. And so the capital N1 and N2 play a role here in the sense of saying, if I need, eventually you need a formula in MATLAB that tells you how to convert the ij back to the n. And this is that formula. And it depends on these numbers, right? And so here, for example, this is like saying that if I put, you know, if I didn't know this grid, right, and I had to figure out how do I go back from the remainders to the i's, I would say, okay, what, what would be my i equals, you know, 2, j equals 3 entry? I would say it's 10 times 2 plus 6 times 3 mod 15 would be 20 plus 18, which is 38 mod 15 which would be uh, 8, right? So this is telling me that in the 2 comma 3 column, I expect to see 8, right? So 2 comma 3 is where I see the 8, right? So that's, that's what I need to do, basically, is to know how to place the elements into the input array to begin with, I need this formula, right? I mean, to be fair, since I showed you the pattern, right, you could also use some slick MATLAB indexing to get there, right? Uh, but if you didn't know what to do with the pattern, you would need this formula, right? So that's, that's where these things come into play. Actually, the output array is a lot easier, right? And so on the homework, not for, so for the vast majority of you, you're not doing this unless you're curious. For most of you, you're doing this one. And so one of the questions I'm going to ask on the homework is, you know, for a given n, what does the input array and the output array look like? And, that, and what I mean is that I want you to draw me two arrays like this and tell me how should I put the input in and how should I take the output out. But that's a lot easier to do because, you know, it's easy to just write down what the numbers should be in the grid. Okay. Other comments or questions? All right. So that's it. So I'll see you in not too soon on Thursday. If anyone didn't get their uh, exams and stuff, please come on up and I will...